record. Okay, we're back and we're going to talk about 307, which is, whoops, that would be the AP lecture, go away. International fuel and re-release. This can be a very confusing topic for some of you, and I'm actually really, really glad that I'm recording this for y'all. So re-watch this, or feel free to, of course, ask me questions. I'm gonna be sitting in office hours every day. Bored, lovely. International fuel and re-release. So planning a flight is a precision maneuver for those who care about an airline's profit. You guys, as airline pilots of the future, are you're one step separated from airline's profits, but you are, um, capable of feeling, I guess, the pressure. So when an airline is making a lot less money, you make a lot less money or you get furloughed. So it's important that we all pinch pennies and dispatchers are trained um, to apply the rules in all of the twists and turns that we come up with to get as, as few pounds of fuel on that airplane as required. So taking more fuel than you need, especially across the ocean in a big heavy jet, burns more fuel. So burning more fuel, just throwing it out into the atmosphere, ruins the environment and it ruins the bottom line for the airline. I'll get up on my soapbox on that. So that's why we have all these rules. So flag applies, once again, just to remind you, when we're not in the contiguous US or the District of Columbia, um, when we're not in the boundaries of Alaska, Hawaii or territory, so you can fly around the islands of Hawaii or you can fly from say, Juno to um, catch can. You can fly those domestically, but flag is anything else. Okay. As far as turbojet aircraft, this is a little bit different. Um, most of this stuff, obviously we're not gonna be tested on it, but there is a Kahoot that en encompasses all of these things. And the Kahoot can be quite a bit of extra credit. So if your grade is suffering, and you attend that Kahoot Live on, um, what do you call it? Uh, live on whichever class I'm gonna give it. Whoops, let me go back. I think it's a couple class periods from now we do that. This is one of the answers. So we're, we're gonna fly for a period of 10% of the total time required to fly from the departure to the destination. Does this sound like legal talk to you guys? It makes my, it makes my eyes droop and it makes me wanna go fall asleep. But seriously, you gotta know this. You have to take off with 10% extra fuel in terms of time, not pounds. Fly to and land at the most distant alternate airport, so you gotta take that much fuel. Then fly for 30 minutes of holding speed at 1,500 feet above the alternate airport. So pattern altitude, that's flag hold. Two different terms, we've got flag reserve and we've got flag hold. This 121-645 regulation is the, what I call the parent regulation. So this is the starting point for turbojet aircraft like a, say an Airbus 320. And if your airline does not have any other, I guess, um, agreements with the FAA, this is what you must have when you take off. Now, this wonky looking slide, the reason it looks wonky is because it's a screenshot from American Airlines. Uh, Pete Schlicking was nice enough to send me a picture of this. And just so I can uh, use you to the maximum extent possible, there's actually many, many types of release plans in terms of fuel. So who are my dispatchers here? Probably Ruben or air traffic controllers. I guess you guys don't care as much, but if, if you're gonna be a dispatcher, this is gonna be something you need to know. A straight dispatch is a really easy one to plan. See, take off at your departure, say Philadelphia, go to your destination, say London Heathrow, and you have to add for the E-reserve 10% of the total flight time. Say it takes seven hours. Let's make it easy, 10 hours. <laughs> That's a long flight to London Heathrow. 10 hours, okay, to fly from departure to destination. You're gonna have to have 10% of that or uh, that is one hour, right? My math is right. Okay, you have to have one hour of extra fuel. Or if you have Bravo 343, which is an op spec, you can reduce that to 5% of the flight time. Okay, 
Reserve 30 minutes of holding speed of 1500 feet is not negotiable. You have to have that. So notice there's an E slash RSV here and just an RSV here. This is called in route reserve. And this is just straight reserve. So this is flag reserve. I'm gonna go back aside and show you. Flag reserve under 121.645 requires all of this stuff but you can actually reduce this based on an op spec. So our project number two is under op spec Bravo 343. Hint, hint, that's a couple of questions in your answer packet actually. So Bravo 343, write that down. You're gonna be under Bravo 343. In fact, I don't think it's written anywhere specifically except for in this slide and I tell you in this lecture. So in your fuel plan, you'll notice something. You'll notice that it says, 5%, whoops, and after this class, I'll pull it up and I'll show it to you where it says 5%. Um, and then there's other, there's two other options as well that I wanna just explain to you in case you ever come into this situation. Say you are going to spend most of your flag time flying over places where you've got ground-based navigation. This could be possible if you're flying from New York LaGuardia to say, um, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I actually did that flight when I was a college student. So New York LaGuardia to Sao Paulo, Brazil has a couple of brief periods over the ocean where you're in class two navigation. So dispatchers and airlines can cheat the system and only take a special reserve of 10% just for the time that you're going to be from the last nav facility to the first nav facility on the other side. And then thereafter, you're gonna need a reserve fuel of just a little bit more. So you gotta take 45 minutes at normal cruise consumption if you're gonna use that rule. This can help hugely for airlines that fly regularly to places, um, flag flights that are mostly in class one navigation. And then the Bravo 44 redispatch flight is basically uh, what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this slideshow. So, questions on this before I move on. What you guys are doing is Bravo 343, 5%. My old project that we had used Bravo 44, so, um, and I've been told, Sean, you'll have to ask your dad, actually, this is a great question for him. I've been told that most airlines typically use a redispatch flight plan. Easy ask him. What's that? Ask him. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot him a text and ask him right now. Yeah, tell them um, we're in class and, and the professor wants to know if Bravo 044, our redispatch flight plan for 10% is like the standard because I've seen a, quite a few of international flight plans now because I kept soliciting them from random airline pilots to make new projects. And yours that you have is probably the only one I've seen under 343. So <clears throat> unusual, but still kind of cool. So flag alternates, just a reminder, if you're going over six hours, you're going to need an alternate, and here's your rules on that. I'm not going to belabor it too much. That's the regulation. Island reserves are a little bit different. This is also Kahoot questions. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to play Kahoot live. I'm going to have to come up with a, a good time maybe to play it with each section that day. So for an airport where an alternate is not available, say, I'm trying to think, uh, I know Lodge is didn't have a whole lot of options for us. Island reserves may be authorized. You have to do two hours extra fuel at the top of descent for turbo jets and three hours for turbo props. Okay. As far as prop and turbo prop regulations on this, um, you gotta have the fuel to the airport which the flight was released to, which we're gonna talk about the complications of that in a sec. Fuel to the most distant alternate, then 30 minutes of normal cruise plus 15%, oh my gosh, so many rules. 15% of the time to fly to number one or two. Oh my goodness. Let the dispatchers worry about this, my humble opinion. Um, obviously you're not gonna be tested on it, but just understand that island rules, they're very complicated. If you're going to Bermuda and there's absolutely nowhere else to land except the ocean, you're gonna have to have plus three hours of fuel at normal cruise. And then look at all these rules. Once again, not gonna test you on that. 
So New York to Puerto Rico, I'm just showing you a variety of different flight dispatch releases here. Um, notice the E slash RSB. 3583 is the number of pounds of fuel and 21 minutes is the time. And then straight reserve or flag reserve is 30 minutes. So 30 minutes, 4035. And then what else do I need to point out? So that's basically one, what I wanted to show you is the two different types of reserve fuel for international flights. Okay, so how they calculated this 21 minutes, it seems like a random number, but it's not. Your flight is 210 minutes and they used a 10% uh, in route reserve and all they did was put 21 minutes in there. So, and then reserve fuel is 1500 hold at 30 minutes. Additional can be whatever they want. Sometimes they add additional fuel just to make it a, an even number. <laughs> and then alternate fuel is exactly how many miles and how far uh, and what else you they figure out all the fuel burn for you. Put it in your handy fuel plan. Old. This one, there's a problem with it, and I'm sure if you're cheating and looking at <laughs> looking at the next slide, you can figure that out. Most distant alternate, hold a destination. It looks great, right? Hmm, based on what I just told you, and I know Tucker's up because I just heard you talk, what is wrong with this picture? Why is this one incorrect? Anyone? I'm looking at the time right now. You said 50 minutes. Look at this line specifically. There's something wrong with the E reserve. This, I've been told this is a, if there's gonna be a mistake that your dispatcher makes, this will probably be it. <laughs> so it's supposed to be 10% of flying time. And I'll just give it, I'll just tell you, you notice 67419, hey, 6742, that's exactly 10% of the fuel. If you look at the flying time, it's six hours and 55 minutes. So what should the E reserve be? Six hours and 55 minutes. Let me see here. Six hours. Oh, 41 God. minutes and, five, and 50 or 30 seconds. Thank you. Math, math gurus helped me out. I, I didn't even get to the point where I typed it in, but. Notice that you've got more e-reserve than you need. Um, it would be bad if you had less e-reserve than you need. So in this case, just take a look through your flight plan and make sure that it's actually calculated properly based on the time, not the pounds of fuel. So switching gears to a re-release flight plan, just to explain why we do this. Um, the, the discussion on cost of carried fuel, I think I've talked to you guys ad, ad nauseum about how how much wasteful fuel, it burns so much fuel to carry or tanker fuel around, especially over the ocean, especially when you consider the massive amount of planes flying over the ocean. So what we do is a safe and legal reduction of the 10% in route reserve fuel. By regulation, if you're gonna fly a flag flight over the ocean by the parent reg from say Philadelphia to Heathrow, you need to take 10% extra for the time. So seven hours and two minutes is what we're flying. You'd have to take 10% of that. So um, we're not going to do that every time. We're going to negotiate with the Federal Aviation Administration and we're going to do a re-release, which means we're going to improve performance. We take off a little lighter and we lose an engine. We're in a better situation, right? Reduce emissions, save money. So the problem with the re-release procedure I guess there's no problem with it. It's typically, it works really well, um, but it takes a little more coordination. So you're gonna take off, you accept the dispatch release, but you're not actually cleared all the way to your destination. You're only cleared to a re-release point. The flight's actually filed with ATC to your final destination and everybody in the back of the airplane thinks they're going to Heathrow, right? I mean, we all get on board, we paid our money, we wanna go to London, but you're not cleared to London, you're cleared to some intermediate point. Right. So uh, the way it works, you're fueled only with the 10% in route reserve required to fly to that point. And then at the re-release point, the 10% is recalculated for that segment only. 
I'll show you an example so you don't get too confused. So I know it seems like a lot of rules and a lot of bending and twisting of things to make just a few pennies, but those pennies add up hugely over the fleet. So um, dispatch basically says, you're re-released in the old flight plan that I used to give you, you were, your re-release point was Bexit, which is about 200 miles inland from London. And if you say don't have the right amount of fuel, so you don't have the cleared amount of fuel at Bexit, then you have to divert to a closer alternate than London. Um, so a re-release basically gives you the fuel to reach your final destination plus 10% of the total fly, flying time to the re-release point, then 10% of the flying point from re-release point to destination. You still get this fuel to the most distant alternate required and then also 30 minutes at 1500 feet. <clears throat> Decision criteria. If you're on board an airplane where you're on a re-release point, um, say we're going to Sydney, Australia from, La, from LAX, and our re-release point is Fiji, Nadi Fiji. I'll show you a pretty picture of it in just a sec. If we do not have the specified fuel aboard that's written on the re-release point, it's a legal reason to divert. You have to divert to Fiji at that point. The other thing we need is a communication with dispatch. So you're actually not cleared to Sydney, even though everybody in the back paid to go to Sydney, you're not cleared to Sydney until you really, uh, get the re-release message from dispatch. The captain must, if he or she does not receive this message or he or she does not have the fuel aboard, you must request a new routing and divert to the intermediate airport. Okay, how often have you guys actually diverted? I mean, how often do you even hear about an airliner diverting? Anyone ever divert for any reason? I diverted across Iceland because of low visibility. Okay. Well, you know, that would be actually a really valid and common reason to divert is weather. But these types of diversions for, say, fuel reasons are exceedingly rare. You would have to have an unforecast headwind of just hundreds of knots extra to burn through all your reserve fuel and not have the re-release fuel you require. Um, but it is all this coordination that we're talking about, this, it's all required because the FAA is allowing you as the airline to take off with less fuel than the parent rig actually requires. So um, an example of how important fuel is in the overall calculation. So if you look at this United Airlines manual, interestingly, so you got a 747. I mean, we got four engines. We got a lot of fuel going between San Francisco and Hong Kong on this straight dispatch release. So imagine we had to take off with 10% of the flying time required to get all the way through this flight from destination, or excuse me, from departure to destination. You'd have to take 26,100 pounds for your en route reserve. And then of course, the 30 minutes is non-negotiable. Either way, you've got to take this. So it's down here too. But using a redispatch which with an intermediate destination of Taipei, you can actually just take 6,100 pounds. Look at that. As opposed to 26,100 pounds. So you save a lot of fuel. So you're not tankering almost 20 grand right there. All right. Um, so yeah, it really, really does save a lot of fuel and a lot of money. Here's the analysis of why we do it. Um, it's kind of shocking when you realize the benefit of a redispatch. And that was the United Airlines manual that actually for training pilots on why. You guys need to know the reasoning behind it too. This is the close up. I suppose I should have gone to the close up, but there you go. Um, here's my last example. I think this is the last one we're going to go over. We got LAX to Fiji, Nadi. This is where you're actually cleared to when you take off, but you want to go to Sydney. So the total distance to the flight is 7,000 nautical miles, but all you need is a 10% of the flying time to get to this point. And then again, 10% of the flying time to get to this point. And so you end up with taking a lot less fuel. Isn't that pretty? Here's you at. <laughs> I don't know why. The, 
There's Nadi. The beautiful big runway. With the this runway was actually built with the intention of international flight diverts like this. Fiji, has anyone been to Fiji? No? I had a chance to go there when I was studying abroad in Sydney, but I ended up taking a different flight, so I didn't go to Fiji. Kind of sad about that now. But anyway, um, so every practically every flight that you get on, if you're going from say the United States to Sydney or Sydney to the United States, you're gonna have Nadi Fiji as your redispatch point. Interesting, huh? Next time you guys fly international, if that ever happens again in our lifetime, uh, ask the pilots to what their redispatch point is. They'll probably think you're the smartest person ever, um, or they'll look at you like you're crazy. Decision process. So it's sort of a sequence of events. Within two hours of the re-release point, you're gonna have to make sure you get the destination alternate weather. It's, it's like a legal requirement. You're planning at this point to land at Nadi. <laughs> you gotta make sure you can land there. Um, and then also specified re-release fuel, contingent on that fuel being aboard, re-release the flight to Sydney. Okay, so if you don't even re get the re-release message within an hour, you're gonna basically reinitiate contact with dispatch and plan on diverting. The legal point of re-release is a beam. It, you must verify that you have the fuel on board, make the decision, and uh, 99 times out of 100, you're gonna just keep going to your destination. This is another example that's slightly different. You're actually flying ha almost, mm, I'd say, a third of the flight over land, but you still have a re-release point. So you're going to DFW, that's your final destination, but the re-release point is this random VOR. So using Phoenix as the divert airport. If you get to the SJN VOR without the proper amount of fuel, or without contact from dispatch, you're going to Phoenix. All right, this looks really complicated, but it's not that bad, I promise. <laughs> it's a two-part flight plan, and this is, if you fly internationally, you're gonna see a lot of these, where you've got a whole block here that's basically clearing you only to SJN. And then furthermore, if you don't have the fuel required, you're just gonna go ahead and go to Phoenix. This is your final destination fuel block. And you can see right here the important number, the plan re-release fuel is 30,060 pounds. If you have 30,059 pounds, you're going to Phoenix, okay? With Tucson as an alternate. So they've backed you up even further. There's several layers of backup here. Um, if you continue, say you have enough fuel and you get contact with dispatch, you go into DFW, but Dallas is your, um, alternate there. So it's like having two separate fuel plans made for you. And let's see, <clears throat> questions on this before I move on? Okay. There's that plan and then there's the final plan. The release fuel out of Honolulu is 144739. Plan re-release, I already said that. Okay, so how to use the flight plan. It, basically, you're gonna take it as if you're on this first one here. You're gonna stick with that until you hit that re-release point. I'm gonna say, all right, we have say 42,000, so we're good to go. And then you switch over and you start using the Dallas fuel plan. Okay, um, what else? Yeah, so this is just illustrating once again, about 4% of what you're tankering around. So if you have uh, a typical flight plan um, and you're taking say 158.075 versus the re-release flight plan having 144, you're carrying around 13,336 extra pounds of fuel that you technically don't need and my predecessor, Randy Raybach, was really smart. He figured out that the average across every fleet, across every jet, is about 4% burn per hour for that tankered fuel. So over seven hours, what's your fuel burn? You could burn an extra 4,000 pounds if you had a tankering of 10,000 pounds. Make sense? Questions on that? 
you guys are not responsible for knowing the math behind this, but it is important to understand that, yeah, you're going to burn a whole lot more fuel if you take more fuel with you. Questions on fuel plans? I'll expand you guys so I can see you. Questions on what you need to know? Okay. So I heard back from my father. Okay. Um, he says that they only use redispatch now when they're going to Australia. They have something new called analyzed contingency fuel, which is derived from a data set of the previous 90 days of aircraft from the same type and city pair. Um, and they take the standard deviation from flam fuel and derive it over a calculated burn. All, all, flights, oh, all flights within the 90th percentile are then averaged for allowed reserve. So, what yeah. Air, does he work for Delta, you said? No, United. United, okay. Else? I'd love to get a slide on that if you can. I keep building and changing things on this slideshow. So if he's got some training slides, I'd love it. Or information. Yeah, yeah I know there's, there's a variety of different ways to calculate fuel, but I think um, just, I guess, conceptually wise, what you guys need to know is that the less fuel you can possibly take within legal boundaries, of course, and safety, the better in terms of profits and bottom line. So um, usually at this point in the class, I'd say goodbye. What I wanna do real quick, since I didn't do it at the beginning, is I wanna click on your, your schedule and just kind of review. Everybody seems to like it when I do this. <laughs> uh, we're gonna look once more at the schedule together. Go away. All right. So zooming in on this real quick. Just to remind you what's coming up before you all go out into the universe. And I stopped this recording. Uh, where are we at? Did you guys know we're officially, as of today, we're on the last page of this schedule? Yay! Um, I'm not promising we're going to play this Kahoot game live. I, I have one. Um, I really would like to give extra credit for it, but I, I haven't quite brainstormed on how to do that yet. Work on your AT chart information and homework because next Tuesday it's due, and I'm here to tell you that is kind of a whopper. Do not leave it to the last minute. Um, it's not going to be Eagle Vision. It'll be Zoom, Zoom Lab on ETP calculations. So March 31st is a really good time. Um, to record a lecture, obviously, because ETPs can be kind of a complicated beast. Um, if, for example, you can't make it to a live class and you go, what is she talking about? Come to my office hours online. You can always email me, you can always call me, or better yet, um, get with Michaela. Michaela actually helped me create the ETP lab and the one that you're doing in your project. So she's very well versed on ETPs and how to calculate those. And then finally, we're gonna do accuracy checks and then we are like on the home stretch because I don't believe, I'm not gonna require you guys to draw ETOPS arcs. There's just that one last lecture. So stay ahead of these homeworks. AT chart, ETP calculation, it says due in class on paper. That's uh, obviously gonna be false. We're gonna do the, uh, the lab together and you're gonna fill it in. And then you're going to have a beautiful template to go forward with and create your own project one. So questions on the schedule before I move on and stop recording? Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. So yeah, uh, it seems like Riddle is kicking out everyone from the dorms. Yeah. Very short notice. So I have to be worrying about that. Just wondering if the due dates might be a little flexible. Oh, yes. Um, because this is so dumb. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I'm kind of floored, in fact. A little bit shocked that they're doing this to you guys in the middle of all this. Well, I think it's quite funny. They give us uh, less than four days to move out, and Arizona state law says that eviction notices need to be 30 days. Wow. So that's fun. <laughs> I mean, like, um, it's not technically an eviction, though. They're just shutting down the dorms. Like an eviction. I know. I think somebody. I think somebody actually had COVID though. I don't yeah. care. I'm not leaving my dorm now. They're forcing me to leave my dorm, interact with landlords, you know, travel around the place. Like yeah. I'm actually more at risk of infection because of this garbage. I'm the same way though. Yeah, I'm gonna stop. Yeah, so.